everybody welcome to this uh, session, which is a plenary session about decision making in allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So now we are addressing the uh, curative approaches in, uh, in myelodysplasia. Um, we have two regular presentations, uh, which we will start with, and then we have two debates by uh, experts um, in the field by Eva Heldström and Pierre Feneau, who will discuss two uh, different uh, patient uh, uh, populations uh, in relationship uh, to the uh, issue of uh, allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So we will start with the first presentation by Thomas Schroeder from Düsseldorf, who will discuss with us the treatment after transplantation, especially in relationship to the relapse issue. Better? Okay. Okay, thanks, we can start. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation, and um, these are my disclosures. Um, as Theo de Witte just stated in the introduction, uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation is a potentially curative treatment option for patients with advanced MDS. However, uh, depending on the um, disease characteristics, but also the transplant modalities, uh, about 30 to 50 percent of the patients will relapse after transplantation, and therefore treatment, uh, therefore relapse remains the major cause of treatment failure in those patients. The prognosis of those patients who relapse after transplantation is generally poor, with two-year survival rates hardly exceeding 20 percent, and um, as you see, the majority of patients is uh, finally dying to the underlying disease, despite of our treatment, and this indicates that our treatment is not sufficient in the majority of patients. Treatment option in this situation of relapse after transplantation generally follow two principles. The first is that we try to reduce the disease burden, and the other is that we try to induce or enhance an anti-tumor immunity. And treatment options range from palliative care uh, and withdrawal of immunosuppression to intensive chemotherapy and cellular interventions like donor lymphocyte infusions or even second transplantation in selected cases. However, a major obstacle in the field of relapse after transplantation is that there are no randomized trials so far, and mostly there, uh, there are not many prospective trials. Furthermore, the analyzers that we have include both MDS but also de novo AML patients, and sometimes this is difficult to compare and also to interpret the results. However, as indicated as an example for, uh, uh, by the French transplant group, um, cellular interventions seem, uh, seem to offer the greatest chance for long-term uh, curation in those patients who relapse, in contrast to those patients who receive only cytoreductive approaches without any cellular intervention. Looking in detail on the treatment options we have, you see that the prognosis of those patients who receive a second transplantation is also poor, with two-year survival rate of 17 percent in this large EBMT registry uh, analysis. And this is mainly due to two facts. You see on the left side on the slide that the relapse after the second transplantation, is, the relapse rate is very high, and also there's a, a substantial rate of non-relapse mortality. Furthermore, we have to keep in mind that um, the patients who, achieve, uh, who uh, receive a second transplantation represent a selected group of patients, mostly younger patients, that can tolerate a second transplantation. Furthermore, those patients who are in remission at the time of second transplantation do much better than those patients who are, uh, have active disease at the time of second transplantation. The, pre uh, the problem is that the majority of patients do not achieve a remission prior to the second transplantation. And this is also the case when we look at donor lymphocyte infusions. Again, the prognosis of patients who um, receive donor lymphocyte in, uh, infusions in terms of overall survival is also limited with a two-year survival rate of 27% in this analysis. 
And the problem is that there's also a substantial rate or risk for acute and chronic GVHD. Again, being in remission at the time of donor lymphocyte infusion is a major prerequisite for long-time survival. And the problem, again, is that we are not able to induce a remission in the majority of patients. In this analysis, there were only 12% of the patients in, the, in remission at the time of the first DLI. Why is that the case? Because patients who relapse after transplantation with AML or MDS do not very, very, uh, respond very good to uh, intensive chemotherapy. As you see here, the uh, CR rates after intensive chemotherapy range from 15 to 45 percent about. Um, and therefore, the, uh, the remissions are not lasting in the majority of patients. And that, thus, there's a great need for novel treatment approaches to improve this uh, in patients with relapsed AML and MDS after transplantation. Against this background, um, we and other, others have considered that azacitidine is also an interesting candidate uh, for the treatment of relapse after allergenic transplantation. And this is mainly based on the following considerations. This drug is active in advanced MDS and AML. Its activity is not linked to a specific MDS subtype or genotype, and this is important as MDS is a heterogeneous and dynamic disease not only at the time of diagnosis, but also after transplantation, and Ulrich Steidl today has nicely shown this uh, in sophisticated models. Its, activity, uh, it's not associated with an access of toxicity and therefore can be administered early after transplantation because the problem is that the majority of our patients is relapsing within the first six to 12 months. Furthermore, it may induce differentiation and thereby induce the expression of immunological targets, for example, cancer-tested antigens, and it may also modulate favorably the LRA activity by affecting T and NK cells. Here you see the retrospective analysis um, that have been published from 20, uh, 2007, uh, 2007, and this is just a, um, a selection of some of the reports that have been reported. You see that a, a limited number of patients has been treated with varying schedules, but also varying dosages of azacitidine for relapse after transplantation with or without donor lymphocyte infusions. And the CR rates are also heterogeneous. They range from 15 to 60 percent. However, it indicates that the compound is active after transplantation. To investigate this in a prospective manner, we've performed the first prospective trial on this, investigating the combination of azacitidine and donor lymphocyte infusion in 30 patients with a hematological relapse of AML and MDS after transplantation. This was a single arm phase two trial, and patients were envisaged to achieve up to six cycles of azacitidine on a five-day schedule at that time, and they were also envisaged to, uh, to receive up to Three, uh, three DLI with escalating T cell dosages after every second ASA cycle. We observed an overall response rate of 30% with seven patients of the 30 patients achieving a complete remission. And the two-year overall survival rate was only 17% also in this trial. And this not, is not comparing better to those what we achieve after intensive chemotherapy. However, we have to keep in mind that these were mostly all elderly patients with an early hematological relapse of AML or MDS after transplantation that could be treated with a cellular and pharmacological intervention uh, on an outpatient basis in the majority of patients. Those patients who responded to the treatment seems to have long-term benefit with the longest follow-up patient in this trial now being in remission without any anti-leukemic therapy after ASA and DLI for more than 11 years now. Already at that time, we were able to identify the disease burden at the time of relapse in terms of bone marrow blast as a predictor for complete remission in univariate analysis, and this was also the case for the presence of high-risk cytogenetics. Nevertheless, due to the limited number of patients, um, there was no chance for a multivariate analysis, and we were also not able to analyze any factors for uh, survival and predictors for survival. Therefore, we went on within the German Cooperative Transplant Study Group and collected more data of 154 patients that were composed of three groups. The one was treated at the University Hospital at Düsseldorf. The second group included those patients treated in the prospective trial I showed you before. And the third group was collected by a survey within the German Transplant Cooperative Study Group. 
Thereby we were able to analyze those data of the 154 patients, which mainly suffered from an AML relapse, but also some MDS and MPM patients after transplantation. They had main, uh, in the majority of patients a hematological relapse instead of a molecular relapse. And azacitidine in combination with donor lymphocyte infusion was the first savage therapy in over 90% of the patients. They received a median of four cycles of azacitidine and in 68% of the patients at least one DLI was administered. In this analysis we were able to confirm the overall response rate of 33% and the CR rate of 27% and the two year overall survival rate in this study was 29%. The incidence and severity of acute and chronic GVHD were rather low and mild, and by the uh, larger number of patients, we are now able to perform multivariate analysis. In this, in, in this multivariate analysis, we were able to identify the diagnosis of an MDS instead of an AML as a major predictor for complete remission. And this also, as you've seen on the left side, on the upper part of the slide, it was also translating into a survival benefit in univariate and multivariate analysis for the patient with MDS. We also identified the disease burden or type of relapse as a major predictor for complete remission. And this also, again, translated in a survival benefit for those patients that were treated at the stage of a molecular relapse instead of a, a hematological relapse, indicating that it's very important to do MRD monitoring in these patients and try to be as early as you can in order to improve the survival. And as you can see, the survival, uh, when you treat them as a molecular relapse, is much higher with up to 60% after two years. What about the other hypermethylating agent, decidabine? The evidence with regard to decidabine is much, it is much lower. There are only two retrospective case series compromising 36 and 26 patients. One is from our group, the other one is from the Freiburg group. You see that the substance is also active in case of relapse after transplantation. However, the overall survival rate at two years is lower with 11 and 9 point in these analysis, but this is probably related to the fact that many of these patients were treated at a later line of therapy, including ASA failures and also those who had rec uh, um, received a second transplantation before, and therefore um, it's difficult to estimate whether that is uh, lower or whether that is comparable to ASA. Taken together, hypomethylating agents are now a valuable treatment alternative for the case of relapse after transplantation, and I think in particular for those patients with an MDS, but there's still much spatial improvement. And the question is, how can we improve the results? Can we be better when we treat these patients earlier, either when there's a first signal of disease called MRD, or even in the absence of a disease evidence as a maintenance therapy? Or could combination therapies with a backbone of ASA and DLI be an option to improve this? With regard to MRD-triggered um, treatment, I would like to uh, acknowledge the um, work of the Jason group. They have uh, nicely shown that uh, monitoring of peri peripheral blood CD34 positive chimerism is a valuable tool to early and precisely predict pending relapse. And they combined this sophisticated MRD monitoring with an early preemptive intervention with azacitidine in their ELISA trial. Um, and patients in this trial were treated with azacitidine in case when the CD34 positive donor chimerism dropped below 80%. And as you can see, they were able, by the green bars, they were able to restore the chimerism in a, a relevant proportion of patients. However, the red bars in the, in the slide indicate that finally many patients still died from relapse, and this was mainly the case because the protocol did not include uh, any cellular intervention in addition to azacitidine like donor lymphocyte infusions. In our hands, and that is what we do in Dusseldorf, we think that uh, monitoring uh, WT1 expression in the peripheral blood of MDS patients is also a valuable tool to uh, perform minimal residual disease um, monitoring since there's a standardized and commercially available assay on the one hand, and for, uh, second, about 80% of the patients with an MDS uh, overexpressed WT1 um, in the peripheral blood, in particular those with an advanced MDS who are the transplant candidate. And this standardized assay offers a high sensitivity um, 
uh, and a high specificity in comparison to the other standard methods we have for monitoring of minimal residual disease, and therefore we routinely use this to monitor our patients after transplantation and to uh, guide preemptive therapy with hypermethylating agents and donor lymphocyte infusions. What about maintenance therapy? There have been some studies with a limited size of patients, and these were mostly single-arm studies investigating ASA and DAC as a maintenance therapy in the past. And on the last ESH, the MD Anderson group uh, presented a randomized phase three trial investigating the maintenance therapy with azacitidine started from day 40 after transplantation in high-risk AML and MDS and CMML in comparison to standard of care. And patients were envisaged to receive up to 12 cycles, which means a one-year maintenance therapy after allogenic transplantation, but the median number was only four cycles that patients could, uh, could receive. And to make a long sh story short, you see the study failed their primary endpoint. There was no improvement by azacitidine maintenance uh, therapy with regard to relapse-free survival. And this is also true for overall survival. And therefore, at the current time, there's no um, evidence to um, say that there's um, a standard of care with an ASA maintenance therapy. There's a second ongoing randomized phase three trial, which is uh, performed with uh, all over Europe and uh, is led by Gesine Buk from Freiburg. They are investigating the pan hdec inhibitor um, panabinostat in comparison to standard of care, again, starting from day 30 after transplantation in up to 350 patients with high-risk AML or MDS after transplantation, but this uh, trial just started last year and is not finalized, so we have to wait for the data of this trial. What about combination therapy? We and other have considered that also lenalidomide might be, might be an interesting candidate to combine with the backbone of azacitidine and DLI for two reasons. First, it may act synergistically with azacitidine, and second is that it has immunomodulatory properties which may, which may enhance a graft versus leukemia effect. And um, here you see the um, tri Viola trial recently published by Charles Craddock's group. They um, investigated the combination of the sequential therapy with azacitidine followed by lenalidomide up to six cycles in 29 patients with AML and MDS in a multi-center phase two, uh, one dose finding schedule, and they showed an uh, overall response rate in those patients with a hematological relapse of 24% with five patients achieving a complete remission, and they identified a dose of 25 milligrams, which is quite high to my impression. We are using in our trial five milligrams per day, and we're afraid of acute and chronic GVHD, and they identified a high dose as the maximum tolerated dose to go further on in future trials. With my last slides, I would like to stimulate maybe also the debate that is coming later, what is uh, the best approach prior to transplant, and maybe whether the pre-transplant strategy may also have an influence on the relapse therapy after transplantation. As all of you are aware, many of you are doing uh, either a cytoreductive therapy with induction chemotherapy or hypomethylating agent therapy prior to transplant in those patients with an elevated blast count in order to reduce the disease burden prior to transplant and to improve the outcome after transplant. However, there are two, re uh, two Re, uh, relevant problems with this approach, I think. The first is that is the relevant toxicity by these two treatment options. This has recently been shown by the Vidaza Allo trial of Nicholas Kroger, for example, where you may lose patients on the way to transplant due to toxicity. And the second problem could be that not many, or there's a relevant proportion of patients that does not re respond either to induction chemotherapy or to hypomethylating agents, and thereby you may select resistant clones that may make a problem after transplantation that cause relapse, and then the relapse may be difficult to treat. This is a hypothesis. I know another option we and other are favoring at the moment is whether to perform an upfront transplantation if a donor is ready and available in those patients with an elevated blast, where you combine the 
cytoreductive therapy and the conditioning regimen, for example, with a FLAMSA-based conditioning regimen, and thereby you may circumvent some of the problems with the toxicity of the pre-transplant cytoreductive strategies. And furthermore, it may be the case, if you are more effective prior to the transplant, then you may cause more, uh, a, lo a lower rate of relapses or a lower rate of resistant relapses. This is my hypothesis, and I try to convince you a little bit by the data we have so far that this may be the case. We've recently shown in a retrospective analysis comparing upfront transplantation with chemotherapy and hypomethylating agent that upfront transplantation is at least not inferior to a cytoreductive strategy prior to transplant. However, taking into account that this is retrospectively analyzed with selection bias in all three groups. However, when we looked in detail in our analysis on those patients who still have more than 5% blast at the time of transplant, you see on the left slide, uh, left part of the slide, that in terms of relapse-free survival, an upfront transplantation is not much better than a, a, a prior transplant cytoreduction. However, when you look on the right side, on the right curve, you see that the overall survival in the same patients is much better than those that are pretreated. And this suggests that maybe those patients may respond better in case of relapse to a relapse therapy. And for that, we went in detail in those, 30, uh, in those patients who relapsed and analyzed their outcome um, according to the pretreatment strat strategy and how they respond to a hypomethylating agent based therapy. And you see on the left side of the slide that those patients that were transplanted directly without any uh, pre-transplant site reductions have a higher CUR rate in comparison to those patients who had received either chemotherapy or hypomethylating agents prior to the transplant. And this translates into a significant survival benefit in the upfront group uh, uh, counted from uh, the start of ASA treatment for relapse in comparison to those patients with a chemotherapy or a hypomethylating agent-based approach prior to the transplant. With this, I would like to summarize that uh, hypomethylating agents have proven to be a valuable treatment option to treat relapse after transplantation, and we are particularly efficient when we use it preemptively in MRD-positive patients. This requires a stringent um, MRD monitoring employing, for example, CD44, uh, CD34 positive chimerism or WT1 expression. There's no evidence, to my opinion so far, supporting a general maintenance therapy in all patients, the, and um, I hope that I've stimulate the debate whether a pre-transplant st uh, strategy may influence response to post-transplant therapy, but this has to be corroborated in a larger number of patients. And I think next approaches that we and other are following is either the combination therapy, for example, with lenalidomide or venonitoclax is also very interesting, or a genotype-specific approach using inv uh, IDH uh, inhibitors, for example, that we will start a trial on that in the year, uh, this year again. With this, I would like to thank the people on the slide, in particular Guido Kobbe and Ulrich Germing, but also Nikolaus Kröger and Martin Bornhäuser, and um, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Thomas. We are running late, so there's room for one urgent question, if any. Oh, do I see anything? No, anyone? No. Okay, thank you, Thomas. We will continue the debate after, afterwards. Thank you.